and welcome to Limbury Theatre and our first inside of Panel Talk, Careers in Technical Theatre. My name is Bat Saber and I'm part of the Mousetrap Youth Forum. I've been part of the Youth Forum for about a year and a half now. I'm currently on a gap year and planning to drama school. And here's our panel. Yeah, here. I'm... Okay. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. I'm Zainet, I'm also on the Youth Forum, I've been part of them for four years. If you um, haven't checked out Mousetrap, do check out um, Mousetrap Theatre Project um, Exhibitor in the break. Um, and yeah, so we are going to, if you can introduce yourself, that'd be great, and what you do. Cool. Um, I'm Javier, I'm a uh, freelance sound designer and sound artist. Um, I've worked in theatre for maybe six or seven years. Um, but I do lots of other sort of projects with sound art on the sides and make my own performance as well. Um, that's me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Prema, Prema Meta. I work as a freelance theatre lighting designer um, and I'm founder of an organisation called Stage Sight. So Stage Sight's really looking at all of the off-stage roles, backstage, and whether that's an inclusive workforce. So we're looking at diversifying the off-stage workforce in terms of class, ethnicity and disability. Um, I've been a lighting designer for over 15 years and part of my journey was to start up stage site because of my experiences. That's me. Morning everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is Mark, my name is Mark Dakin. Uh, I'm currently the technical director here uh, at the Royal Opera House. Um, I've been working in the business for 40 years, so I'm feeling quite old. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, uh, I had an art school um, training. I worked with designers um, in their studio making models. Uh, ended up working in production management and um, gradually more and more senior jobs. Um, and I suppose the main part of my career was at the National Theatre, 21 years at the National Theatre as production manager head of production and technical director. And then I came here seven years ago to be the technical director here. Amazing, Amazing. thank you. And before we move on, audience, please think of questions now whilst we proceed. As well, if you're at home, send in your Q&A via the chat function and let's continue. Great, so we're gonna start straight away with the questions. We've got some and then we'll throw over to you. Um, so our first question is, with so many aspects of technical theatre, how did you choose your specialism? Did you try one and stick with it, or did you try them all and then uh, kind of find the one that you wanted to specialise? And what advice would you give to young people thinking about choosing and thinking about getting into technical theatre? Shall I kick us off? <laughs> um, so I trained at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Back then, it was a three-year degree course, but the actual subject was technical theatre and stage management. So the brilliance of that degree course and spending three years learning meant that I could do a little bit of props, a little bit of wardrobe, sound, lighting, stage management, cover all of those areas backstage. And I think that was an excellent course for me because I went in knowing that I love the world of theatre working backstage, but I wasn't quite sure what I should specialise in. And it wasn't until my second or third year where we went on placements and I decided that design was a real thing for me. I loved working in design. I grew up loving art, but it was about what sort of designer could I be? So I was very fortunate back then and I went on a two week placement with Ez Devlin, stage designer, and two weeks with Neil Austin, lighting designer. And I got to just work out what it was that I preferred the most or what I thought would be the right fit for me. Um, and I think what's really important to say is I decided to go into light and design because actually it scared me the most. So at 21 years old, I felt, and this is just a personal feeling, I felt that I was more frightened of lighting than set or stage, and therefore all the more reason to go and give it a go. That was my, yeah, that was my decision-making process of my career. Yeah, I sort of uh, I sort of relate a lot to that sort of just doing the thing that makes you sort of scared or like that's a challenge. Um, I think I personally came into um, sound from a more from a creative background and not from a technical thing, and I was quite resistant for a long time to kind of to say that I was part of technical theatre um, because I think I saw myself a little bit more compositionally, even if it was through kind of electronic means. Um, 
I studied music and I have a background th there. I sort of studied in uh, electroacoustic composition, which is composition through electronic means and through using a combination of analog and digital uh, processing. Um, and I just fell into creating work for theatre and creating sounds for theatre. Um, so uh, I didn't, I kind of just chose, I kind of just got there because, um, because that's kind of what I ended up doing. Um, and then I guess I sort of, then I started making decisions about like what I wanted to be within that, which I think personally has been exploring interactivity and like not sort of uh, two things that are too fixed. Um, so yeah, that's been kind of like, I've just guided myself kind of through aesthetics rather than through uh, a sort of career progression. It's a long time ago since I started but I, I think the, I think the honest truth is um, I f fell across working in theatre totally by accident. Um, at school I wasn't mm, good at much, but I could do technical drawing and I could do art. Um, and what appealed to me the most about working in theatre was collaborative working, working in a group of people. So there was no sort of real, okay, I want to be a stage carpenter, I want to be a, a, a scenic artist, I want to be a costume maker. I just wanted to be part of the team making, making work. And I used to better say that I had done almost every single job that there is, whether that's stage management. I think the ones that I had not done really seriously were wigs and makeup. Um, and video, because video wasn't, wasn't around when I, when I first started. But, but, the, but, but the choice was very much around wanting to work as a team, collaborative process to make great um, shows. That was, that was all. And Prema, on your website you say it's critical for art and culture to reach a wider community and is made for everyone, for everyone, which I'm pretty sure we all agree with. So on that note, when creating your work, how do you ensure it aligns with this? For me, I'm not sure if it's about creating the work in alignment with that. I think it's about the workforce. Who is it that makes theatre? Who is on the stage, backstage? What are the shows that we're producing? What are the stories that we tell? Um, and I think there's a lot more discussion in the last year about what is the purpose of theatre and who does it reach out to? And I think all of us would say it should reach out to all of us. Um, I think there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done and I think it's really important that we consider who we're working with and the stories that we're telling at every moment of planning. So even if we just, uh, I don't know if anyone's a Strictly fan, but I was watching Strictly <laughs> Come Dancing over the weekend and, and Rose, who is a contestant, who is an actress but is deaf, um, she took part last on Saturday and the theme was musical theatre. And she said she loves musical theatre but she doesn't get the chance to see musical theatre often because there's no captions. And that felt like a real moment of um, ensuring that we always give consideration. Everybody should have the same access, fair access to theatre at every part, whether you're an audience member or you're somebody who's contributing directly to either the production because you're performing or you're working backstage. So I think these are just thoughts that every department needs to give all the time actually and I don't think it's a big ask either. Oh, no, not no. at all. If you haven't checked out Stage Sight, um, I would. Like, I checked it out before this um, knowing that I was going to meet Prema and I didn't know that it existed and um, it's something that I have been challenging kind of the industry about so I would have a look at it. It's really great. Mm -hmm. And Javier, how is your sound work for theatre different to your other work? For example, your implementation for gaming and what advice would you give for any budding sound artist? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Big question there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in theatre mainly because of the form of theatre. Like I, I quite like the idea of sort of locking people in a room for an hour and making it really rude to leave. Um, and I kind of think that the, what you can kind of do with that with an audience there is really quite interesting. Where compared to sort of more conventional sound art stuff like within an installation or as a part of a a performance or something like a gig setting where it's you know people just kind of milling and out and stuff so I think that's like from for me like aesthetically what's different is 
a, a sort of different consideration of form and structure because if I know that I'm going to basically that someone's going to be there for an hour, an hour and a half or whatever, then I can structure things a little bit differently um, compared to if people are going to wander in and out. And obviously there's loads of more sort of like, depending on the piece, more kind of like specific considerations. Um, what I would advise, I think it's, I think it's important to follow your own course and to follow what it is that you want to do and see and hear and perceive and, and, and people that you want to work with. I think it's much more important to, uh, to do what you want <laughs> than it is to do what you think is expected of you, especially in an industry that has no like, ladder, there's no like, stable uh, progression. So there's no point if you were working at somewhere which was like, okay, you work here for three years, then you do this assessment and then you get to banking level two or whatever, then that's great. But uh, here, like, you can make your own sort of thing, whether that's, so I've gone down the thing of being, you know, independent artist, blah, blah, blah. I kind of spend a lot of time looking for work, applying for commissions, applying for grants and all the rest of it. And that's a big chunk of my work uh, because I've chosen to kind of just be, be completely uh, independent but other people will, for instance, work, especially sound artists, for instance, might work in a studio doing sound design. Um, so like you mentioned games, for instance, that's almost all like studio based where you're working on contracts for three or four months. Um, so it really depends on what kind of what you want to do. Great, thank you. Um, Mark, you are the director of technical production here at the Royal Opera House. Could you advise us on an action plan for any young person who might be thinking, you've got my dream job, how do I do it? <laughs> I, 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 surely, where are you? Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's an action plan. I mean, it's a, it, it, that, that's quite a difficult question because I think, um, I think theatre and institutions like this, large institutions, but also smaller theatres, um, have changed a huge amount over the time that that I've been working. You know, I I I think that I say regularly that I'm one of the last um, technical directors who probably started sweeping the stage. You know, that, that, those are the jobs that I did. I, I started sweeping the stage, and I now lead. Sort of, I've now led, had the privilege of leading two of the largest technical departments in the UK. I think that's a progression that is no longer possible because the world is different and um, and you are running businesses and in this case it's a multi-million pound international business in an environment which has health and safety legislation employment legislation and that is stuff which i spend a lot of time reading about and learning about that's nothing to do with what i started doing yeah you guys are talking about um and indeed, I'm talking about the reason I got into theatre, which is um, collaborative process, working, working, working with people you want to work with. I think that's sort of a really, really, really important thing. And I think uh, the only thing I'd say about these leadership positions um, is they are wonderful. Don't get me wrong; they are, they are, um, they are um, wonderful. But any young person who I've met who has said they want to do the sort of job that I want to do, I've always said, look, I still think that those are jobs which you need to have a base of experience of putting on shows and you need to have a base of experience of understanding the creative process and what creative people want to do so that if and when you do get to these positions, you are making sure that you are facilitating the thing that we're all here to do, make great work, and not getting bogged down in and all the boring stuff and you're keeping that away from every, everyone else. So I don't know whether that's really advice, um, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> that's perfect, that's thank great. you. And on that note, um, Javier and Prema, what top tips would you give for anyone thinking of getting into technical theatre today? So we'll start with Javier then, and Prema. Um, well, I think the, the sort of conventional sort of route, for, as I understand it, sort of now that people are kind of offered uh, to get into backstage work, say as a stage manager or a technician or, um, or crew or whatever, would be to get on casual lists from local theatres and stuff, which is 
uh, actually quite effective also if you're not living in London because there's almost always some kind of receiving house, so something that receives big tours. Um, that is always looking for crews with a turnover and stuff and you can learn your basic sort of setup. up um, If you're looking, going into sort of design stuff, I think it's, you know, there's kind of, well, a little bit of what I said before in terms of like, you, you just, just find out what it is that you like and do it. Uh, and also, I think, understanding what kind of, what kind of presence you want to give yourself, whether that's, uh, some people work really well with social media, for instance, and can post really well and create really good profiles, and that's really, really good. Um, I suck at that. Uh, so I'd prefer to spend more time building, like, uh, a sort of static website that, can, that has a kind of, like, here you go, here's all the information, rather than loads of, like, content. I think both of them work really well, and there's probably loads of other ways. Um, but I think making some decisions about how you're going to get to where you want to get to and doing a bit of research into what other people do and, and what is useful is going to be really helpful for you because a lot of people kind of wander about a little bit aimlessly and that's not super helpful because you can be using that time a little bit more productively. Um, yeah, that's all I can think of. Um, I think it's... I remember my mum telling me that I was planting seeds. And I think I didn't quite understand that until I was further on in my career. But I, I think there's something about, when you first start out, think about, as Javier said, where you want to go. But I think there's a, a realization that it does take a while to get to where you want to get to. So there is something about planting seeds in that you would invest in relationships so reach out to directors that you want to work with, contact them, invite them to see your work. It's likely that they may not be able to make that production, but I think going forwards, if you keep in touch with them, you're building a relationship and hopefully they will come to see one of your productions. So I think there's loads of ways in which you can think about developing relationships with the people that you want to work with, plant those seeds. I. I feel hypocritical to say be patient because I am the most impatient person, but <laughs> there's something about acknowledging that that is work that, you know, I remember planting those seeds not knowing I was doing that, but sending out the invitations, investing in coffees and making time to meet people. And then me personally, for me, it took eight years before the work really flowed in. And what I realised was because I built those relationships, repeat work came in. So once you work with someone, if you have a good time with them and it's a successful collaboration, they will call you back. But to have left drama school, I didn't assume that I would just get there very easily, but if I was assuming that, I would have been, for my journey, I would have been incorrect. It definitely is an investment, but one that hopefully pays off if you, if you stick at it. Mark, any top tips? Any top tips? <laughs> I think you've covered it really well. I think one of the points, I can't remember which one of you made it there is no career ladder so therefore anything is possible and i think the building of networks is really important and 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 nothing is off limits the great thing about people in this industry i believe is they really want to help they really genuinely want to help so in the old days, I used to say to people, send people postcards. That's probably a bit old-fashioned now, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know what a postcard is? You probably don't know what a postcard is. <laughs> so, you know, it is about building. It is about, it, 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 it is about building the networks. And it doesn't matter whether the most senior designer, the most senior producer, just, just reach out. Because people really want to help. Great. Can I, yeah. yeah. So something that I think is important, which is like a, a bit of, it's, it's kind of a negative really, um, but is something that I've sort of realised more and more uh, in the past couple of years is that people who have more privilege than you are like really well set up to be, to get there and you cannot compare yourself to them <laughs> because it's not about ability because there are people who have the like family connections or they have more money in them or like whatever like whatever kind of thing that helps obviously theatre is quite a 
relatively liberal and open kind of you know society and stuff but we still live within everything else and people who have more money are just obviously better off people who have parents who are in theater can tell them all of the traps can tell them what a good day rate is can tell them all of this stuff it, someone's obviously in, in in a much better position and i would just say to not uh not think about that too much because actually it can kind of paralyze you and be like especially if you get to you know like milestone thing if you're like oh I'm 21 I'm 25 I'm 20 whatever like and I can't I haven't got here because so and so has done that and you're like yeah well so and so's you know brilliant yeah you know. brilliant brilliant advice that's such good advice because really I good definitely advice. compare myself to a lot of people no, like that run so. your own race you're <laughs> exactly yeah. um, right so this is the last question that we're going to ask and then I'm going to throw it out to you guys so start oh. thinking of questions if you're on Hoover send it on the app we will be checking them we will be calling them out um, but yeah, audience members, think of your questions because I am expecting lots. Thank you. <laughs> this is the last one. Um, so obviously we're kind of going towards a post-pandemic world, we hope. How do you think the pandemic has changed the role of technical theatre and impacted your role in particular, especially with online, like Prema, I know you did Him, which was an online production, absolutely fantastic. Like how did that kind of adapt your role and impact technical theatre for you? Big question. <laughs> Shall I answer yeah. to that point? I think, um, yeah, of course the pandemic took us all by surprise and, and uh, as a lighter designer we did have a lot of our work going either out as a film or live streamed. So actually there was a conversation about lighting the camera um, and it, it's quite strange looking back because you think you're set up with a very theatrical way of working Sometimes it's quite tricky to transfer skills across. So prior to the pandemic, if I thought about film or TV, that probably would have meant that I would have had to train again or something. And suddenly we're there in a theatre like the Almeida and we're having to live stream. I think for me it was a really exciting journey because I had the opportunity that I usually wouldn't have, which is to translate my work for stage for the human eye through to camera and I had to learn very quickly but as a person I, I love learning and I think I get a bit stale when there's not an opportunity to push forwards and expand and grow so I think um, I think it was sort of a, a blessing in disguise to upscale quite quickly and there was a little bit of work around virtual reality and again just thinking about virtual reality and mentally thinking that's not a world for me but actually that was a skill that I had to learn over summer last summer um, and I think it's just fascinating to register how much and how quickly technology is moving especially when we talk about live stream I don't think it's a temporary thing I think there's a there's a certain remit there for people wanting it to continue so um, yeah I think it's just about expanding what we know and using transferable skills to light for um, for camera as well as theatre and and there are I think there's exciting dy dynamics in both I don't think I actually prefer one over the other they just come with different challenges and um, it makes every project quite individual which I which I love yeah I um, I guess I guess yeah it's sort of uh, you know from a sound perspective was probably one of the easiest transitions away um, in terms of that you still kind of record and make sound uh, but for my personal practice which was completely rooted in liveness with especially within theatre everything was rooted with like okay how are audience triggering something how is an actor triggering a sound how is like all this how I how do I relate to the sound of the space all of that was gone and so suddenly I kind of had to become more audio engineering-y which um, was never really my thing I never I was never really a gearhead I didn't really care that much about that stuff um, so um, so that was kind of interesting and I don't, yeah, I don't know, like, I, I mean, the pandemic sucked, didn't it? <laughs> it was terrible. Um, and yeah, I think there are, some, there are some really cool things that have come out of it, which is, yeah, it's really nice that it's not been a complete waste of time. Uh, but I hope it, as a kind of industry, there's kind of two things pulling either way. There's the people being like, you know, build back better, all of that stuff, and people demanding better pay and better, uh, unions and better kind of regulations and all the rest of it and then you've got theatres and cultural organizations that are still being sort of starved of money and starved of funding uh 
you know, which is obviously something that has gone on since austerity and blah, blah, blah. But then with pandemic, it really, they've now kind of struggling a lot more. Um, and so it's kind of hard to say sort of how, what the post pandemic world will really look like because the cultural recovery fund money hasn't run out yet. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think it's an opportunity to learn new things in, in new ways. But I think the landscape has shifted in a way that we don't quite understand yet. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely right. Who knows what, I, when we're not out of the pandemic, the pandemic yet, it has been terrible. Lots of people have lost their jobs. Lots of organisations are financially on the brink. That isn't over yet. But in that, post-2020, there is an opportunity. There's a massive opportunity if people can be courageous enough. And whilst we've lost a lot of people who have decided that, you know, actually working long hours and um, working in the evenings is not as cool as like doing a nine to five driving a van for Sains, Sainsbury's, which a lot of my mates have done. Um, there are opportunities for other own people. And you're absolutely right. The industry needs to think about working differently so that we can be more inclusive of people who want to better see their families or, you know, all of those sorts of things. You know, I'm undecided about digital and the digital world. Yes, it's fantastic and it is a supplement to what we do and it is here and it's giving access in a way that is absolutely amazing. But it will always be, for me, this industry, about people in a shared space sharing a, sharing a performance. Um, and being a part of an audience together in the, uh, in the room. I just hope that whilst the industry is under so much pressure, financially, emotionally, everything else, um, for want of a better word, the gatekeepers, the people who are in control, have the courage to look at things differently and don't just grab for the things they know and therefore go back to business as usual. I think that would be a real missed opportunity. Great, thank you. Amazing. We are now going to open it out to the audience. I'm going to go live in the Limbury first. Does anyone have any questions? And I've given you loads of time to think, so I'm expecting <laughs> hands. Yeah. Emmy's got a mic and she's going to repeat what you say just so that everyone at home can also hear. So that was, how did you get your first designer gig? Who wants it? Me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I d it depends kind of how you define gig, really. Like, the first sound that I, designed, that I made for theatre was at uni. I, again, like, kind of, you know, like everyone says, they sort of fell into it. My thing, I was... Uh, uh, I, I, I'd wanted to be an actor when I was like 13 and then when I went to uni to study music I was like oh I'll be in a play that'll be fun um, and then I was talking to the sound designer who decided to who said I've, I've had enough I've, I'm, I'm too snowed in with work to do all this sound design and he was sound designing all of the plays for the drama society and then I, I was like hey I'll take over um, so I did a bit of that after that in terms of finding professional work it was mainly through creating little portfolio pieces. Um, I later learned that it's much better to make video if you can, because people, are, people are, who are not sound uh, thinking or whatever <laughs> won't struggle a bit to, to kind of understand how sound can fit into visuals. Um, so it's almost always good to kind of get some good like video stuff. It depends what kind of sound design it would be, because some of it is uh, much more kind of like linear chronological cinematic kind of sound design and then you can kind of do trailers and film stuff and whatever and otherwise yeah just do loads of little portfolio things and send those out to as many people as possible I think that's how I basically got it uh, and then as soon as someone a director comes to see a show and they like the sound that's when it starts snowballing I, I think I would say I know you were joking about postcards but I sent an awful lot of letters out to everybody um, and it paid off in that uh, I, my first design gig was at the White Bear Theatre, which may now be closed, somewhere in Kennington, tiny little mm. pub, 
dodgy electrics, um, <laughs> directed by Michael Longhurst, artistic director now of the Donmar Theatre. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I'm sure one of those letters paid off and I probably covered directors and producers and, uh, and got a phone call for a tiny little profit share. But that was definitely the beginning of my journey. I can actually answer that question. <laughs> I, Good. <laughs> um, because I went to uh, do a course at Croydon College, which was called Theatre Design, although I really went there to do the technical aspects of theatre. Um, so I did do design, and I actually worked as a design assistant in a, in, um, uh, in a studio. I say a studio. It was a basement flat in Cam Camberwell for a director designer who... Um, who gave me my... I, I was assisting him doing, doing big projects and a project came along that he didn't want to do and he asked me to do it. So that was the route that I got my first design job. And there is a much hidden away portfolio of designs for, I don't know, about six or seven years. Um, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> don't turn <tell> anyone. <laughs> Thank you for your answers and thank you for your question. We're now going to open up to the upper circle where Nadia's over there with <laughs> white mic waving. And just same things, put your hand up and Nadia will come over and repeat your question to the panellist. Come on, I've given you loads of time. I'm Don't all jump to the mic. <laughs> yeah, so. No, should we go, go back to the stools? Think about your questions, we'll come back to you. Yeah. Anyone else in the stools? Yeah. Do you have any international experience in your different sectors? And also, I'm going to add to that, what do you advise for people who want to go international with their careers? I don't, so I can't offer any advice. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to? Uh, yeah, I, I've done, I've done uh, if I've done sound for someone who's been based here and then has moved away, mm. I've continued to kind of do that. Uh, but I haven't actively sought that. Uh, yeah, great, uh, you know come on over um, <laughs> but um but yeah i mean uh, i think i think um to a certain degree doing anything small scale is a little bit more difficult because of brexit so um so it's probably more for for kind of like larger kind of tours and stuff like that that you're going to do something i i don't know if we'd really class this as international i've got as far as germany and france um but actually those jobs were with a uk team so as a team I think largely we rehearsed in the UK and then we together we moved across and put our production on there. Um, but I would say the connections there have come from a UK base uh, team. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I reached out, I, didn't, I certainly didn't write letters to, to people in <laughs> France and Germany, put it that way, maybe I should have done. <laughs> I don't know, that's a really interesting question because again, I think you've you've covered the bases i think a lot of designers and i think about uh, colleagues who i've grown up with through my career who work now mainly in mainly in europe um uh, that will be initially through a relationship with a director or a choreographer um uh, who who ends up working working abroad and i think i mean my only advice would be what I think I've just said is that nothing's off limits. There's no reason why you shouldn't go and work abroad. Obviously, working in Italy, if you do not speak Italian and you're working in drama, is slightly more diff different if you're working in Italy and you're working as we are with a choreographer with dance. So again, it depends on what form you're working in. Um, that's not advice, is it, really? <laughs> anyway, you know. So no advice. No, no <laughs> sorry, not very helpful. But, 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 you know, look, I mean, the world is smaller. And, um, and Brit I mean, I don't know, I'm not going to assume all, all, of, all of you are British, but the one thing I do know is British theatre design, whether that's set, costume, sound, lighting has a fantastic international reputation. Mm -hmm. um. Amazing. Anyone else? If not, I will ask a question, but I want you <laughs> to get your voice in. So, yeah, Hoover, amazing. Well, I'm coming from online. I'm happy to have you for. It's lovely to be here in New Zealand. Like, my career is still going to get more technical data, so 
and it's been a really interesting to hear from you all. Um, but from online, we've got, um, is technical theatre, um, a role in technical theatre, more likely to be a permanent staff role or self-employed contracts? And how do you work with those? Mm, good question. That is a good question. Um, I, I can just say that I work as a freelancer, and I think when I first started out, I, I looked at how you could be a lighting designer, and actually there were only maybe two, if that, residential lighting designers in permanent positions in theatre. Oh. So there wasn't any choice. I had to become um, self-employed. I had to work as a freelancer to, to do the job that I'm doing. But that's as a, a lighting designer. Yeah, yeah I've, uh, I don't think I've ever seen a <laughs> permanent, um, permanent sound design job at all outside of um, theatre maybe with um, uh, film studios and stuff and but basically people have a lot more money to be to be able to hire people pay for people when they don't have something going on um, so it's all freelance but usually that actually kind of suits you better because you're able to kind of choose the stuff that you want to do and work with people and kind of be like oh, okay well actually I'm going to take this month off to work on blah 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 and yeah for me it's worked much nicer doing that um, but yeah you well, no, well, I, if, if I was a really good technical director, I'd absolutely know the, the statistics, but basically the industry is freelance. And one of the things that was really challenging in the pandemic was, of course, a lot of those freelancers didn't really get captured by any of the government support. Um, and it's one of the things the industry needs to think very, very carefully about, because we are absolutely dependent on the freelance community. They are the designers. Um, they are the choreographers, they are the directors, they are the actors, they are the technicians, they are the wig makers, they are the blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, so um, certainly there are institutions like this where there are permanent jobs. We don't have permanent sound or lighting design, that's very true. Um, but there are jobs where those skills are required here. Um, but yeah, it's basically a freelance industry. And I think I would just add to that because there's um, a brilliant organisation that was formed at the beginning of the pandemic called Freelancers Make Theatre Work. And it found that 70% of the workforce so, were made up of um, wow. freelancers. So an enormous number of people contributing actively to the sector. And, and I think quite right, Mark, um, not quite the... Uh, I think when, when we fell into the pandemic, we didn't quite get recognised for the worth that freelancers were... Uh, contributing towards the sector. Yeah, yeah, I think I'll put it a bit stronger than that. It was absolutely yeah. scandalous, <laughs> the lack of recognition of what the, yeah. of what the industry is. Yeah. I mean, the industry, and if you think about the cultural sector, but our part of the cultural sector is worth millions. And, you know, we are the backbone of the film industry as well, and TV. So many people in theatre go on to other, you know, um, um, skills and 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 yet there was no recognition and, and um, support for the engine room um, which is the freelance community going off of that did, like when you started out freelance like did you find it really daunting having to do your tax returns and being self-employed and like what advice would you would you give to a young person because for me like being freelance is a really daunting aspect like of getting into the industry like I've got rent I've got bills to pay like, what advice would you have, I guess, for any young person thinking, this is what I want to do, but rent and bills, you know? Tax returns are really much easier, much <laughs> easier than you think. <laughs> um, they're also like, I think, so obviously, you know, I think that they used to be, I, I never had them on paper, and I think that was like this whole thing that you had like 40 pages. That yes, you had to check it was. Like my, parents, was my parents have talked about that and whatever. It's honestly like, it's fine. <laughs> um, like you do your first one and, that, and then you're like, oh my God, what's, what's going to go wrong? They're going to charge me a thousand pounds because I ticked a box that I wasn't meant to tick, but it, it's totally fine. <laughs> um, the problem is kind of what we were alluding to in the last question is that there is like no support uh, for freelancers really outside of unions, which are pretty weak. Uh, and outside of sort of statutory thing, uh, minimums, which are very low. Um, so I think it's really important to clue yourself up about kind of what, what that means and any kind of support you can get and support networks and stuff because um, everything in the workforce generally in this country is geared kind of towards permanent staff and away from the kind of gig economy. Um, so um, 
so yeah, so I just kind of, yeah, do that. But it's good, it's great, it's fun. It's like super independent and uh, you know, you can kind of dictate your own stuff. And if you're like, oh, actually, I realize that I want to get paid more, you just tell people that you need to, you just say, I charge this now. <laughs> and that's much easier than, than trying to be like, oh, okay, well, maybe in three years, I'll get a pay rise. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think I dreaded tax returns, but I think I did have the 40 page paper version. Um, yeah. And I, th I think, <laughs> thank you. I, I think there's something as easy as, you know, drama schools could do a lesson mm -hmm. in how to do your tax return because it, it can feel overwhelming if you haven't been taught that and suddenly you're freelance and you have to complete a tax return without an accountant. Um, that can be daunting. So I think there's a little little fix that could be made, very easy fix if drama schools uh, included that just in a one-off lesson. Um, but I think the other two things I would say would be that I remember as a freelancer, as brilliant as it is, and Javier, you're right, you know, you get to pick what you work on. There is this feeling of isolation. You, you go, well, I went from a drama school, being in a class of 20, 25, to suddenly being on my own journey. Um, and I think as a lighting designer, I worked from home, so I would do my lighting plans from home. That in itself can be quite isolating. I think I reached out to a few lighting designers who would tell me that they would sit in coffee shops and work from a coffee shop because they liked being in a, a sort of different surrounding. So I think there's something about um, teaming up with colleagues who are freelancers can help make the journey a little bit less lonely. And I think I think what we haven't quite touched upon is, I may be making it sound quite straightforward, but there were years where I took work outside of theatre because I had to pay the bills and because I was worried about finances. And at the beginning, as a freelancer, you may be building up your network, which means that you don't have work throughout the whole year. So I think there's no shame in working outside of the industry. Um, but I also think, you know, I, I really celebrate the, the jobs that I've done outside of the industry have helped me enormously as a person, have helped me to grow. I've learned a huge amount and I've brought those skills into theatre, even if it's being a collaborator, being a team player, being, dare I say it, fearless. Um, so I think, yeah, that's no bad thing to, to explore other roles whilst you're on this journey. Yeah, I think... Um I think I might have said at the beginning, uh, what appealed to me about this industry was collaborative practice mm -hmm. and listening to what's being said. I, I think I'd say, look, freelancing isn't for everyone. And obviously it wasn't for me. I didn't know it at the time. I've, I've enjoyed being in institutions, being working in theatres, you know, uh, opera, op, op, opera houses, most of my working life. And I don't know whether that was a conscious choice, it's just the way that, I think it was just the, um, just the way that it happened. So, you know, look, freelancing isn't, isn't, isn't for everyone. And there is an industry where you can go and get a job. Okay, it's tough at the moment. Well, I say it's tough at the moment. Actually, the industry it doesn't have a worker force. So now, at the moment, there are jobs going in... Um, in uh, in organisations, so you know, look, freelancing isn't isn't is, is, isn't for everyone, and that's fine. Um, but what you're not going to get if you um, are probably leaning my way is you're not going to get the freelance lighting career or the freelance sound career mm -hmm. with the potential that that brings, um, which these guys are realising. Amazing. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Javier, Prema and Mark for joining us and thank you everyone for joining um, our first panel talk here at the Limbury.